Hello and welcome to Winter's Edge. In this cozy tavern, I'm going to read you one of my stories, and as I read that story, I'm going to illustrate it. I'm sure you've got lots more questions, but for now, chapter one. Fifty years ago, a mofa crouched low over the fallen husk of an iron giant. The squat man was breathing hard. The heavy knives in his hands trembled with fatigue. The giant's fall had stirred up dust from the dry earth. It still hung in the air. The crash still echoed in Amofa's ears. The thing had been huge, standing at least two stories high. All hard, jagged edges and elongated limbs. It had taken everything Amofa had to bring it down, and it was but one of many. Amofa scowled as he looked across the battlefield. By his count, at least 300 giants, shambling towers of stone and steel, made their ponderous way up the great road. The armies of Rulorn had already scattered before the steady advance. No doubt the men would try and regroup further down the road. They had been doing this for a few days now, preparing to make a stand, getting soundly beaten and forced to retreat, only to try and make another stand. This is what desperate men do, men whose families waited at their backs, Men with nowhere left to run. Amofa spat. They were running out of land to retreat to. Soon the giants would be at their door. Rulon would fall within a week if it was lucky, and that was only because the giants moved so damn slow. They had already crushed Yor and its fabled school of magic. Now they marched under a long shadow cast by the dragon's tooth, the great mountain that sat in the middle of the coastline, the halfway point. Amofa looked to the south, through the swirling dust that trailed the army of giants. Distant fires burned softly through the haze. That was all that was left of Talibor, a city named after one of the old heroes. That defeat had been humiliating. The city was destroyed because it was in the way. The giants had simply moved through it, barely missing a step and leaving a ruin in their wake. Amofa was at the edge of the terrible migration, keeping his distance. Even from here he could feel the plodding steps of great iron boots rumble through the ground. The fallen giant at his feet had strayed from the pack. He had brought it down without the rest noticing. He needed them to move on, leave this one behind, put a distance between them. He needed to know if they could die. His eyes narrowed as he scanned the sky. Orbs of coloured light circled overhead like vultures following the towering army. Every now and then one of the lights would fall and plunge into a giant, flaring it briefly with colour. Amofa tracked the wispy trails they left behind. All of them came from a spire of lights that spun lazily in the centre of the army. The whirling vortex hovered over a strange wagon. It looked like a house on wheels. It was being pulled by a massive, four-legged construct that towered over the other giants. The orbs of red, blue and green leapt out of a funnel-like chimney that took up most of the wagon's roof. They would get caught up in the vortex and spin slowly upwards. When they reached the apex, they would expand their circling, searching for constructs to dive into. Amofa intended to test the limits of how far they would search. It was the green ones that Amofa was waiting for. He watched one pop out of the wagon's chimney like an egg and get caught up in the vortex of light. It spun its way slowly to the top, increasing its speed as it widened its arc, joining the flocks of hunting reds and blues. Even from this distance, Amofa could hear the orbs hiss through the air like angry cats. The orbs of red and blue quickly plunged into the front lines of the giant army. But this green orb ignored them. It was looking for something else. It circled wider and wider. Amofa watched in dismay as the green orb came closer. Even this far back, it had found them. The orb hovered overhead for a brief moment, and then almost seemed to scream in triumph as it plunged from the sky. It crashed into the construct beneath them. There was a sound of screeching metal as the green light spread across the fallen giant. Amofa watched with a frown as broken iron rods stretched like serpents, intertwining each other, pulling themselves together. A severed closed fist made of stone was lassoed by the tendrils of green and pulled back to an iron stump of an arm. Amofa growled. He had broken two of his heavy knives trying to hack that thing off. 
The assassin leapt lightly off the giant as the thing shakily made its way to its feet, casting a long shadow over the dwarf. Slabs of iron sheets groaned as they stitched themselves back together. The giant's great head turned slowly and regarded a mofa with eyes that glowed with a soft green. It had been fully healed. A mofa spat at its feet and pulled the shadows around him. A gust of wind flattened the grass and carried him away. Chapter 2 50 Years Ago The king stood stooped on a great wall. He was a big man, round in the belly and sporting a tight bed, as if to accentuate a chin that was slowly disappearing. A small group of men stood behind him, giving him distance. The city of Roulon was also at his back, unnaturally quiet, as if holding its breath. The king looked to the south, where his round stretched as far as the eye could see. It had been beautiful. Plains of rolling hills, lush forests, and majestic mountains. The king blinked with wet eyes. Now a great scar travelled the land's length the path of a monstrous army that had destroyed everything that stood in its way. It ended here at the foot of the king's city. A last desperate stand was made on these very walls. Against all odds they had won, but the cost had been terrible. Other cities under his rule had been crushed and his armies shattered. The years to come would be dark times indeed. His realm was a broken battlefield. Crows filled the skies, and the bodies of his men littered the ground. The air tasted of ash. Despite the carnage, this was not what drew the eye. Giants stood in the fields. Huge constructs of stone and steel paused in mid-attack, as if frozen in time. A terrible army of behemoths that yesterday had seemed unstoppable. The king stood face to face with the closest giant. It had almost reached the wall. This one was mostly made of stone, somehow fused together to make a crude, ape-like body. The head was massive, a moss-covered boulder roughly the height of a man. Its creator had taken the time to carve in a blunt face and hollow out the eyes. The king shuddered. Those eyes had been glowing less than a day ago. Now they were lifeless pits. The king couldn't decide which was worse. He gazed upward. The giant had raised his arms to the sky, ready to crush the wall. It had been that close. The great rock hands hung over him, stalled in the attack. The magic that had powered the constructs had fled, leaving them as hideous, lifeless sculptures. The bodies of his brave men surrounded them. Two men moved to stand beside the king, one tall and arrow straight, wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a huge drooping moustache. The other was old and bearded, but powerfully built. The king heard them, but didn't turn. He held the stare of the stone giant. How did he make so many, he whispered. The tall man glanced at the older man, unsure if the question was directed at them. The older man just stood still, his head bowed as if under a great weight. The tall man stepped forward to stand beside the king. He too found himself looking into the black eye pits of the giant. He cleared his throat. After the banishment we lost track of him, my lord. He's had over two years, and with his power the king cut him off. After his banishment? After I banished him? He turned to the tall man. You think this is my fault, General? Of course not, my lord. No, said the king. He pointed at the scar that ran through the land like a jagged wound. I did not do that. There was something unnatural about the burnt-out path. It shifted under the gaze and brought on a wave of nausea. The king looked away. The general nodded. Karul. Not Karul, snapped the king. Magic did this. He turned on the old man. Your magic, Cordan. The magic you teach in your school. To your students. The group behind the king shifted uncomfortably. Cordan's gaze stayed on the ground. 
I did not teach this, my lord, he said, barely at a whisper. Well, it's out there for the curious. You give them the tools to find it, the king turned his back to the old man. This was always going to happen, he muttered. If not Karul, then someone else. The power is there for the taking. Look at what one man can do. He glanced at Cordan. The old man's head was still bowed. Look at it, screamed the king. Cordan finally looked up and saw the battlefield. He saw the rolling smoke, the circling birds, and the still corpses of men stretched as far as the eye could see. He saw the thousand constructs standing like jagged towers over the carnage. It was all his fault. What would you have me do? he finally whispered. Oh, you will do nothing, said the king. Ever. Again. Magic ends here. There will be no more schools, no more teaching, and no more weavers. There was a gas from the small group of men. General Hawkins was taken aback. My lord, the enemy will not stop using magic. We must be prepared. You are finished too, General. This was your failure as well. The general paled visibly. We stopped the attack. You did not, screamed the king. He grabbed the general by the neck and thrust him against the ramparts. The wide brim hat fell to the fields below. Look at your armies, general. Is this your victory? General Hawkins grit his teeth as he hung halfway over the wall. His hands kept him from toppling over the waist-high parapet. He glanced back at the group behind him. Some of them were smirking. Do not look at them, shouted the king. Look at your great victory. General Hawkins narrowed his eyes as he took in the carnage. The king held firm. Well, is this your victory, snarled the king, shaking the man savagely. One of the general's hands slipped and he was pushed further over the edge. My lord, please unhand me. Answer me, the general snarled. This is is not a victory, my lord. The king leaned in closer. His meaty hand held the general tight. He pushed the man further over the edge. No, it is not. Because you rely too much on magic. It has become a crutch. And when it failed you, well, we saw your worth. Without it, you are less than a man. General Hawkins heard a snigger behind him. This was too much. Enough, he said and suddenly the king was hauled into the air. An unseen force lifted him over the wall and held him in place, hovering high over the field below. The king's legs thrashed as he struggled in front of the general. The tall man brushed himself down. There was an outcry behind him, and the general turned to the group. Quiet, or he falls. The men paused, swords half-drawn. Corden watched the king thrash in the air. He squinted at the general in confusion. Hawkins, what are you doing? What I should have done years ago. What I could have done at any moment I wanted to. He stretched out his arm and his hat returned to him. Why do we let this pathetic little man rule over us? He has no special strength or intelligence, certainly no real power. He is our king, said Codan simply. He just banished you, you, Kodan, the greatest of us all. You should be leading us, not, not this. The general waved dismissively at the struggling fat man. Lead us, said Kodan sadly. Hawkins, I could not even run a school. No, it is over. Put him down. The general stared hard at Kodan, but the old man was not looking at him. He still looked at the battlefield with dead eyes. The general's face softened and his shoulders sagged. The king landed roughly on the rampart walls. General Hawkins watched the fat man struggle to stand with contempt. Your power is nothing, an illusion given to you by fools. You don't want to banish magic to protect the realm. You just hate that it makes people more powerful than you. The general gave Cordan a small nod. Call on me when there is need. Suddenly the general shot up into the air at an impossible speed. There was a booming crack of thunder, and he was gone. Cordan simply stepped off the edge of the wall and vanished. Chapter 3. One week ago. 
Magnus Tolvold stood on a stone balcony and looked over the nobles' district. It was dusk and the air had cooled somewhat. He preferred it to the midday heat, where he seemed to sweat constantly. He took a long sip of red wine, pausing afterwards to contemplate the jewelled goblet he drank out of. It always reminded him of the new life he had built for himself. He now had all the wealth, power and the respect any man could need. His eyes grew hard and he put the goblet down. He would give it all up in a heartbeat to live the life he once had. A poorer man in a smaller house with his family. It seemed a lifetime ago. He looked down from the balcony. He was on the highest floor of his tower, three stories up. He watched a patrol of six guards pass underneath, young men marching in step. To these mortals, it was indeed a lifetime ago. None of these guards were alive when Magnus's world collapsed. Even their fathers would have been too young to remember. Fifty years ago, the constructs had invaded, destroying everything in their path. His whole world had disappeared under one monstrous footstep. It had happened so quickly. One day, he was a respected tutor at the realm's most powerful school of magic, teaching alongside his wife. His daughter was a student there. The next day, he had been run out of this town, forced to leave the bodies of his family behind and live in the wilderness, half-starved and wild. Folk he had called friends turned their backs on him. One even tried to kill him. The weavers had become hated. The destructive power of magic that had destroyed a kingdom had been blamed on them. Magnus took another long pull of his wine. There was some justification to the blame. So the weavers had disappeared. Some had fled the land entirely, others hid away and lived alone as hermits, and some, like him, changed their names and appearance and eventually returned to civilization. It had been 30 years since he returned, starting out as a lowly merchant, selling tools he had stolen from a blacksmith in Roulon. He had always meant to repay the poor man, but had never got around to it. Maybe tomorrow. Magnus had spent the next 10 years keeping a low profile, living a humble existence. It was 20 years ago that he started his climb up the social ladder. The weavers had largely been consigned to legend. Magic was a half-believed myth, mocked as some sort of tall tale from the past. No one remembered him. They all knew him now. He was one of yours most influential nobles, second only to the lady in terms of political power. He scowled at that thought and found himself staring across the district at another tower. It was taller than his by two stories. That's where the lady lived, probably eyeing his tower right now, sipping on slightly more expensive wine. He knew what he was doing, trying to fill the deep void in his soul with meaningless things, wealth, power and respect from people whose opinions meant nothing to him. Still. It gave him something to do. Delivery from Tok, sir. A boy's voice startled him. A youth hung over the rooftop above, holding out a package. Magnus frowned, and he felt his skin crawl. The boy was dark-skinned, scrawny, and covered in rags. His long, dreadlock hair was tied back, and he watched Magnus with strange golden eyes. An Udai, one of the fallen people. Just looking into those glittering eyes sent a shiver through the man. He didn't bother trying to hide his disdain. How did you get past my security? He asked roughly. Went around the fat one, tiptoed past the sleeping one, said the boy as he waved the package. Magnus snatched it down irritably. The boy's hand stayed out expectantly. Magnus sighed and put a tin coin in it, careful not to touch the boy. The youth paused for a moment, eyeing the jewels on Magnus's goblet. Magnus held on to it a bit tighter. Then, like a cat in the night, the boy was gone. Magnus sighed. Seeing a Udai always put him in a foul mood, reminding him of a dark time and of a man who started it all. It also bothered him that his security had proven to be so poor. The political game in Yore was a potentially dangerous one, 
assassinations were not unheard of. Magnus himself had ordered several. He would have to tighten up his estate. He weighed his package in his hand. He knew what it was, a commission he had ordered from the tinkerer. It was a whim, really. He had more coin than he knew what to do with, and he had missed playing the game. He was sure with his connections he could find an underground tournament, especially here in Yore. The king's rule didn't extend this far anymore. He had still been practicing magic in secret, trying to keep up his skills. He was sure he would be competitive. This generation of players could hardly compare to the opponents he had faced in his prime. Maybe he could make the Iron Circle, if that still even existed. It was a risk. Weaving was still banned, even in a town as lawless as Yore. Maybe even more so, as Yore had almost been destroyed by the stuff. An unhealed scar still ran through it, a corrupted piece of land where no one lived. Magnus wasn't too worried. There had always been whispers that he was a wizard. Most old men of power had to endure such rumours. He had even heard that some thought he was the Chris King, especially with what happened to the lady last year. Magnus smiled at that. He had even started cultivating the rumour. The Chris King was a feared half-myth, a mysterious wizard who supposedly watched over Yore. Why not pretend to pull the secret strings that ran the sea town? He had noticed a new respect amongst the nobles. Even his political opponents seemed to step around him more lightly, not wanting to draw the ire of the Chris King. A movement caught his attention overhead. For a moment, he thought the boy had returned. He was about to snap an angry retort, but his voice caught in his throat. Several shadows floated onto his balcony. He caught the flash of silver blades and the curling of red magic, and then felt a blow to his neck. It staggered him, and he fell to his knees. He didn't feel anything, ever again. Chapter 4. Present Day People seldom looked up in the shanty town of Yore. It was not a place for daydreamers. It was a place to keep your head down, watch your step, and hold your coins close. The crowded, narrow streets were a sea of people, a powerful tide that drew the eye. Merchants selling their wares, travellers searching for lodgings before night fell, sailors returning to their ships. People seldom looked up. Makeshift towers crowded the sky, haphazard structures that loomed at impossible angles. They swayed in the light sea breeze. Small, cat-like creatures leapt between them, threatening to topple them. Far better to keep your eyes to the ground and concentrate on the more immediate dangers like the crisker at your feet, the street urchins that eyed your coin purse, the hard men that tracked you with hard stares, the dark alleyways where shadowy figures lurked. No, people seldom looked up, and that's the way Rue liked it. This is where he ran free from the crowds and its dangers, where his feet moved in time with the swaying rooftops, and he glided over narrow pathways at dizzying heights. Rue was a fleeting figure of rags and bones. His skin was a dark brown, his weary eyes an almost golden amber. His hair was wild and thick, tied loosely at the back with frayed cloth. His features marked him as a Udai, a once proud race of plains people, now fallen and disgraced. He carried his people's love of open spaces, and out here he was above the sea-damp shadows and under the sun, Running where the birds flew and the sky began. His leaps over the fog-filled alleyways set him free, if only for a moment. He landed lightly, as sure-footed as a cat, and followed a path of planks, worn smooth by his footsteps. The Crisco were up here too. You couldn't escape them in your long-bodied and agile with a cat-like face and huge ears. They were well suited to climbing the towers and could easily leap the huge distances between them. They knew Rue well and seemed to delight in running with the boy. Rue felt comfort in their presence, like he was part of a pack. It sometimes felt as if the Chris King himself watched over the boy. Rue was a runner, a messenger that ferried notes to all corners of the sprawling sea town. There were not many options of employment for a small orphan boy without any connections. 
especially an Udai boy. Either find your own way or join the gangs of Pirate Bowl and work for him as a thief. Rue had briefly joined the gangs. He had become skilled at picking locks and pockets. He found himself in a band of brothers, finally part of a family. Unfortunately, it was the kind of family one wanted to leave, where the brothers were bullies and the father figures were drunk and stupid. The mothers, with their painted faces, were best not thought of at all. Rue had managed to leave the gangs and find more honest work. He was delivering a package for Toknow to the Lady Poldark, who was as close to royalty as you could get in this broken down port of a town. Rue was heading south, navigating the zigzagging planks as they weaved their way between the leaning towers. Occasionally he would look to the horizon, where the sea stretched as far as the eye could see. There were other lands out there somewhere, an unknowable distance to a small boy who had never left town. He felt a familiar yearning, a pull to that distant horizon, to the haze where the blue sky met the blue sea, but he also felt the chains holding him here. That fear of the unknowable horizon and the comfort of the creaking planks at his feet. He continued to run. His knowledge of the rooftops and his remarkable ability to navigate them had made him a prized runner. In a town where merchants fought tooth and nail for any edge, swift communication was a must, and Rue was the swiftest of them all. Free of the congestion in the foggy streets below, he could cover in a few minutes what it would take other messengers an hour. Few tried to imitate him. The daring leaps over three-story alleyways or walking the narrow planks at dizzying heights either turned them back or lost them forever. Rue, however, loved it. The rooftops took him away from the world below. The air was fresh and the sky clear. From up here he could see another world not so far away. Giant redwoods loomed to the north. Great trees so tall their branches disappeared into the clouds. Rue had listened to the tales of travellers and knew that a great lake lay behind the redwoods and beyond that lake a jungle full of dark magic. Beyond that another forest that was home to the elves, if they existed at all. He had never seen one. Even beyond that lay the cold catch mountains, a wall of jagged rock that held back the winter from the north. It was in that eternal winter that the Juroth lived. Rue had seen a Juroth. He was tall and imposing, with a skin of blue hue that was covered in shimmering tattoos. As the boy climbed higher, scaling a knotted rope to get to the highest path of the planks, he paused to look north again, his eyes drawn to a bleeding mountain. That was the dragon's tooth, said to be the home of a sleeping dragon. It marked the centre of the great coast, known as Winter's Edge. Beyond that mountain was the king's city, the fabled Rulorn. The boy scowled at the distance. Rulorn had abandoned the seaport of Yore, left it to fend for itself after the great fall. If there was one thing that a small orphan despised, it was those that abandoned their responsibilities. With one last dark look north, Rue let the planks take him behind a broken stone tower. His concentration returned to the dizzying path ahead of him. Lady Poldark's estate lay in the northern quarter, as far away from the docks as possible. Hers was an old shipping family, made rich when Yore was the gateway to the realm. When the town fell outside the king's law, the Poldarks continued to run a trade empire, but dealt in more shadowy circles. The northern quarter still tried to retain a sense of old world civilizations, as the rest of Yore fell into lawlessness. Rue knew it was a facade. The Poldarks were as corrupt as Pirate Bowl. Nevertheless, as he watched the cobbled streets from above, the difference was noticeable. The crowds had thinned and the merchants were gone. A large amount of guards patrolled the streets, dressed in the Poldark's colours of red and gold. There were other estates here, owned by a number of wealthy families, pretending to be nobles, all with their own militia. Rue frowned. There were a lot of guards, far more than usual. There had been an assassination a week ago, 
an elder noble had been killed in his tower, and now the northern quarter was on high alert. Rue had actually delivered a package to the noble around that time. He vaguely remembered him as tall and bearded, and that he tipped poorly. Rue suspected that the lady herself had the man assassinated in some political game these nobles liked to play. These extra guards were just for show, to avoid the attention of the Chris King. Still, a week was a long time to keep pretending to care. Rue sighed. He would avoid the streets and the soldiers. Even at the best of times, the riffraff from the docks, especially in Udai, were not welcome in this quarter. If he tried to tell the guards he was bringing a delivery to the lady, they would just take it off him and pass it on themselves. Although miserly, the lady would still occasionally tip some coin. Fortunately, Rue knew a rooftop way to the estate. It involved a bit of agility, but nothing he couldn't handle. He made his way along the edge of a rickety wall, balancing with his arms wide. A few Kriska led the way, their long tails snaking behind them. When Rue got to its corner, he leapt lightly across the gap between the buildings, ignoring the three-story drop below. Swiftly, he zigzagged across a maze of old tiled rooftops and paused atop a high wall. A lush, well-kept garden spread out below. The boy's eyes narrowed as he quickly searched for guards. Once satisfied it was empty, he dropped softly between the hedges. He quickly made his way to the back door and knocked loudly. The door opened and a tall, hunched figure loomed over him. Ah, young Rue, said a raspy voice. Avoided the guards again, I see. It was Gerald, the lady's butler. Rue breathed a sigh of relief. He had hoped it would be the old man. He had always treated Rue kindly. Rue held out the wrapped package. A delivery from Tok, the tinker, for the lady, sir. The old man took the parcel. He must have once been an extremely tall man, almost hitting the door frame, even as age bowed him. Ah, very good, young Rue. Any idea what it is? He brought it up to his ear and shook it gently. Rue shrugged. Just a watch, I think. I saw him repairing it last night. Oh, very boring then. Not one of his toys. Rue smiled. Tok made most of his coin fixing and maintaining mundane mechanical pieces, but he was best known for the intricate clockwork figures he made. People came from all over the land to buy the tinker's work. Very strange people, if Rue was being honest, of every possible race and lifestyle. He has almost finished your one, said Rue. Ah, that reminds me, said the butler, as he rummaged around his pockets. He pulled out something that glinted in the sunlight. It looked like a gold coin. I need you to get this to him, for my doll. He will know what to do with it. Rue took the coin and looked closer. It was definitely made of gold, but it was like no coin Rue had ever seen. It had a spiral of runes engraved on one side that led to a tiny gemstone that rested in its centre. It felt very heavy. What is it? asked Rue. Just an heirloom. Best hide it, though. The tall man glanced around quickly. Uh, it looks valuable. You should take it to him yourself. No, the streets aren't safe at the moment. Especially for an old man. We are all accused of being wizards these days. Pirate Bowl is calling on the Chris King curse with the way he is treating us. Rue glanced up quickly at the old man. He did look like a wizard. Even in Yore, where the king's law held no power, magic was forbidden. It had almost destroyed half the town, and the fear of it existed to this day. The boy frowned and looked again at the carved runes on the coin. Gerald, he said carefully, where is this from? Gerald shrugged, but Rue caught a flash of fear in the old man's eyes. Up north from the Jurath, I think. It looks forbidden, said Rue, unable to say the word magic out loud. Ah, it's just old. Here, I'll pay you well for the delivery. He pulled out a silver coin. It was about a week's worth of work for the boy. Rue hesitated. The strange coin must be worth a fortune. It was dangerous to carry anything valuable through this town. Pirate Bowl's gangs often targeted the runners on the off chance they had just been paid, or were delivering something of worth. Rue knew no one would believe him if he said he had been robbed, especially being at Udai. 
They would just assume he had stolen the item for himself, and that would spell the end of work for him. Gerald was also right on the way Pirate Bowl's gangs had been acting lately. They had been harassing a lot of the old folk, breaking into their houses and even searching them roughly and openly in the streets. They had accused them of being wizards. Rue suspected it was just a way to rob the poor folk in the light of day. It must be cutting close to earning the Chris King curse. Rue could understand Gerald's fear. Getting caught with an item that looked magical would spell trouble. The primal fear of magic could turn any group into a bloodthirsty mob. Gerald saw the hesitation. All right, a silver and ten coppers. I just need to get it to talk before he finishes my totem. Quickly, lad. The old man pushed more coin into the boy's hand. It was more than ten coppers. Rue began to protest, but Gerald closed the door, leaving the boy alone in the yard. Rue sighed. Chapter 5 A short while later, Rue made his way out of the lady's quarter with 16 copper coins and a silver sealed in his backpack. The strange gold coin weighed heavy in the pouch around his neck. He had carried coin on behalf of his customers before, and as always, had the brief thought of keeping it for himself. Rue knew this was a short-term plan. His messenger run continued because some of the people in Yore had come to trust him, and to break that trust would soon see his work dry up. Tok had always told him that as a Udai, one mistake was all it took. Still, the gold coin would easily feed him for a year. He was keen to get back up to the rooftops. He ducked into a narrow alleyway. The fog grew thick here. There was a figure huddled against the wall, one of the many beggars that lived on the street. Rue moved quickly past. Spare a coin, Chris Runner? A voice wheezed. The boy paused in mid-stride and glanced at the figure. It was a bent old man covered in a ragged blanket. A large white Crisker sat on his shoulder, its red eyes fixed on Rue. Rue sighed. It was considered bad luck to not show charity in front of a Crisker. The Chris King saw everything after all. Many beggars tried to keep Crisker for this very reason, though they made for reluctant pets. Rue fished out a copper and tossed it to the old man. May the Chris King slumber, said Rue, clumsily making the customary blessing. He stirs, lad, rasped the old beggar. But you are watched over. Keep walking the straight. Thank you. The old beggar stroked his crisker. And fat white hair tells me it is time for you to run. Rue frowned and then glanced up at the open mouth of the alleyway. His heart sank as he saw shadowy figures move in through the fog. A girl's voice carried, calm and cultured. Well, well, Rue. Looks like you are trying to cross our square without paying the toll. Rue recognised the voice and knew what it meant. Smoothly, he lunged further down the alleyway, breaking into a sprint. Get him, said the voice, and a chorus of shouts joined her. Rue didn't slow for the corner as it turned into a broken brick wall. Instead, he ran up the wall his left foot hitting a sill of boarded up window, his right foot finding the edge of a stone pillar, his left foot finding another ledge as his hands pulled him up to sit on a wall two stories high. He looked down at the gaping, soot-smeared faces. Morning, Vince, said Rue, pleased his voice sounded steady. I'll avoid the toll road today, I think. He thumbed over his shoulder. Rooftops are free. Chris Law... The girl called Vince stepped forward from a group of six large boys. She leaned against a thick wooden cane and walked with a noticeable limp. She was tall, but stood stooped over her walking stick. Vint was a pale son, obvious from her albino skin. Her face was painted in her gang colours, long blue streaks falling like tears from her eyes. Her long flowing mohawk was also dyed blue. 
She looked at the height he had covered in his climb and gave a grudging nod of respect. We will see about the Chris Law. She turned to a blonde boy beside him. I told you we should have surrounded him. The blonde boy shrugged. Vint looked up. How much coin did the old man give you, Rue? Rue's heart sank. They must have been watching him. If they knew he had gold on him, they would chase him all night. They would rob him, and no one would believe Rue didn't keep the coin for himself. Two coppers, he lied. And I'll pay a copper toll if you let me be on my way. Vint's eyes narrowed. Lucas says he saw gold. The blonde boy beside her nodded. Lucas can't even put his pants on the right way, said Rue. It was definitely gold, mumbled Lucas. And Rue smiled as he saw the boy glance down at his leggings. No, just copper, said Rue with a shrug. He heard a sound behind him, a foot slipping on mortar, and he turned to see three hooded boys climbing onto his roof. Vint had indeed sent others ahead to surround him. Rue pulled his legs up under him and sprang forward, leaping across the alleyway, over the gang below. His hands caught the edge of the wall on the other side and he swiftly pulled himself up as hands reached up for him. He stood and looked at the three boys. They hesitated to attempt the same jump. He smiled at their caution. Kriska gathered along the rooftops, chittering in agitation. The gang below pulled their hoods over their heads. It was a bad sign when someone tried to hide their features from the eyes of the Chris King. It meant misdeeds were to follow. The hooded figures disappeared into the fog, looking to find a way up. Vint stood alone, watching Rue. A small smile playing on her face. She absently stroked a gaudy necklace made of painted wood and nails. The girl gave the boy a nod and then turned, limping slowly away. Rue took a quick look at the boys across the alleyway. It was time to go. Rue was small for his age, a wiry lean alley cat swaddled in patchwork rags. He ran at speed now, trusting in his knowledge of the rooftops. Kriska ran before him, and again he felt the oneness of the pack. There was no hesitation as he let dizzying drops and scaled high, sloping walls. He edged across narrow ledges, hugging tight to the great towers. He climbed angled roofs, and then he slid down the other side, crouched low, ready to burst into a sprint again. It seemed the rooftops were suddenly filled with people. Vince gang were many, and this was their territory. They also knew the rooftops well, and for every menacing boy that fell away behind Rue, another seemed to spring up to his left or right, outstretched hands clutching for him. Rue ducked and weaved, staying just a step ahead of the growing gang. There must be close to 20 of them now, all shouting out where Rue was, giving instructions to head him off. The Kriska in front of him suddenly backtracked, warning Rue just in time as four boys appeared out of nowhere. Rue had to retreat, leaping over another boy who was just climbing up a wall. He was being funneled, and he was pretty sure he knew to where. The Kriska spread out as if trying to find their own way out of the trap. Many returned to Rue, giving him warning that Vince's gang were approaching from that direction. Rue found himself following the path of Kriska that continued going forward. Higher he went as homes made way for larger warehouses. The horizon of the ocean lay ahead. Rue was being forced towards the docks, where his maze of rooftops would run out. He glanced over his shoulder and saw the spread out line of Vince's gang. The gaps in it would quickly close if he attempted to turn. Grimly, he pressed on, looking for a way to get around his pursuers. As more Kriska returned, he knew his options were running out fast. Suddenly, the slanted rooftops fell away and swaying masts filled the horizon. The smell of fish filled his nose. He had arrived at the docks of Yore. He had run out of rooftop. He stood at the edge of a three-story rise and looked down. The pier was below him, filled with workers unloading a catch from a lean fishing vessel. 
A large group of Kriska gathered at the edge, chittering angrily. Rue turned. Vince's gang circled behind him. The boys had slowed as they realised their prey was cornered. They were all breathing heavily and did not look happy. Some of them eyed the Kriska wearily and pulled their hoods further over their faces. Give us the gold, Rue. Stop stuffing us around. Rue recognised the voice. It was the blonde boy, Lucas. Rue looked over the edge again. The docks here were narrow, the sea not far away. Boats were loosely lashed to grey-green piles, leaving small gaps that were bridged by thick planks. The sea moved heavily between these gaps, dark and foreboding. Rue sighed and backed up, taking a deep breath. He could not afford to be caught. The gang was almost upon him when he dashed forward. Rue's eyes narrowed and the edges of his vision blurred red. With his eyes locked onto the small gap between the docks and the boat, Rue leapt. The gang of youths surged forward, hands grasping thin air as the small boy left the roof's edge. Rue seemed to soar, his legs still running in an impossible leap. As he cleared the dock, he pulled his arms to his side and became straight as an arrow. He plummeted into the narrow gap and disappeared into the churning sea with barely a splash. The gang pulled up to the roof's edge, scattering Kriska as their eyes scoured the murky depths. Lucas slammed his fist down in anger. Rue was gone. Lucas turned to the others. They watched him with worried eyes. So, who's going to tell her, he said, eventually. The end of chapter five. Chapter six. Rue watched from the long shadows of a setting sun, wet and shivering from his dive. He hid in an old boat yard and peered through the broken hull of an abandoned ship. Kriska slinked around in the shadows, making soothing, cooing sounds. One was close enough to touch as it stood on its hind legs, looking out through a crack in the wall. You could pat them sometimes but more often than not, they would give you a warning nip. Rue ignored the creature. Vince Gang still roamed the docks, trying to find where he could have surfaced. Some stood on the furthest pier, pointing out at their anchored boats. Others disappeared back into the streets of Yore to keep a watch on the inroads. Rue checked his neck pouch and felt the weight of the gold coin. His silver and coppers were safe in his backpack. It wouldn't be long before the gang searched the boatyard. Rue sighed as he slipped away. He would have to go through the oldest part of town. He felt a chill as he crossed into a neglected street. Here, the damage after the fall was so great, it had been abandoned. Not even the Kriska came here. A strange sickness still lingered in the air that withered the skin and stole the breath. Only the poorest of the poor lived here, and they did not live long. Rue knew not to stay in this cursed place. The sickness would rot the lungs after a few days, and it would take weeks to recover from. Still, it lay between him and his hidden home. It was also the only place Vince Gang would not go. Rue moved silently through the collapsed cobbled streets. The fog grew thicker here. Everything was damp. The stone path slick with stale water. Old awnings collapsed and rotting. Night was fast approaching, and he shivered as the shadows darkened. It was unnaturally quiet in this part of town. Most living things avoided it, a natural instinct at the wrongness of the place. Even the noise from the distant docks seemed reluctant to enter. An occasional hacking cough from some poor soul would echo off the broken buildings, all damaged and torn. Some structures were burned so badly that the stonework had melted. Magic was a distant memory to the people of Yore, banished long before Rue was born. As he stole through these cursed streets, he could see why. A primal fear shivered deep in his belly, a fear at the damage magic could do and the taint it could leave behind. 
You could still feel it here, crackling softly across the skin, pulling at the hairs on his arms. It was little wonder that it was banished, if it could do this to half a city. He continued, crossing rubble and ruin, careful not to slip. The only sound was his muffled footsteps, light as they were. Night had settled in, his only guide through the misty darkness was a blurred half-moon. Often his world was plunged into heavy shadow as old towers, still standing defiantly, loomed over him. Finally, the dull moonlight faded behind creeping clouds, and Rue found himself in the blackest night, where he had to hold his hands out in front of him, feeling his way forward. As he rounded a corner, the boy was surprised to see a flickering light spilling across the street. It glowed from a window, pulsing in hues of blues, reds and greens. Rue paused. He would either have to backtrack or hurry through this spilled light. He was cold and tired and just wanted to get home. Rue shivered as he edged forward. The window was large and attached to an old tavern. Its sign still hung loosely overhead, although its words had long faded. Rue peeked inside, knowing that although he could see into the lit room, nobody would see out into the darkness. The tavern was almost empty, long abandoned. Its room-length bar had collapsed upon itself, and shattered bottles lay all around it. A back door hung off its hinges, showing stone stairs leading down to a basement. Dusty tables made of rough wood scattered the room, some overturned, others broken down, their legs splayed. One table, the most intact of them, had been wiped down and set in the middle of the room. A large lantern hung off a chain over it. On either side of the table sat two figures, unusual figures, the kind of folk people would look at twice, even in a crowded room, let alone in the middle of an abandoned part of town. But Rue barely glanced at them. His attention was drawn to the balls of light that flowed between them, unnatural wisps of colour that circled around them like fireflies. Was this magic? A deep chill ran through Rue. What else could it be? He backed away from the window, his heart hammering in his chest. He should run. This was too much. Magic? He was exhausted and cold. He just wanted to be home. He found himself up against a wall on the opposite side of the street, crouching in the shadows. The window still glowed, casting its flickering cutted lights across the cobblestones. He looked down the street. Rue cursed like a sailor. Could this day get any worse? All he wanted to do was run in the sun and then sleep peacefully in his safe forgotten tower. But no, instead he was soaking wet and stuck in a cursed street with bleeding magic poking out of one of its windows. Oh, and he was probably carrying an illegal magical coin that half the criminals in Yore were now looking for. But that window beckoned. The colours pulled at him. He needed to see more. Rue shook his head, might as well push his luck all the way. Moving silently, Rue approached at a half crouch until he was under the windowsill. He was shaking uncontrollably, whether from his damp clothes in the night air or from fear, he wasn't sure. He took a deep, steadying breath and then peeked once again into the room of swirling lights. The end of chapter 6 Chapter 7 It took Rue a time to make sense of the scene. The two figures sat opposite each other, and the light seemed to spring off their flickering fingers. The wispy orbs would then circle high above the table, before plunging into a dive like hunting hawks. Rue's eyes narrowed. The lights were striking two small, moving figures on the table. What were they? Kriska? No, smaller than that. The boy leaned closer, his face almost pressed against the glass. They were little dolls. One had a helmet, shield and spear. The other was made of sackcloth, with a great button for an eye. And they were fighting. They were alive, 
leaping and spinning, attacking and defending. The wispy light swirled around them in greens, blues and reds. The fighting was fierce, the soldier doll's spear flashing as he thrust out from behind his round shield. The one-eyed doll swaying and ducking as he avoided the attacks, almost dance-like in his movements. It did not seem like a fair encounter to Rue. The soldier doll was well armed and made of iron, while the other one had no weapons, just arms made of sackcloth. However, he fought gamely. He spun away from a spear thrust and rolled across an upraised shield. He continued the spin until he was behind the startled soldier. In one smooth movement, he leapt and thrust out both feet, hitting the armoured doll squarely in his back. The soldier staggered forward, but regained his balance. It turned and crouched behind its shield, advancing more warily. The man behind the little soldier nodded in appreciation. He fights well. The other one shrugged, their features hidden beneath a ragged hood. He cannot hurt you though. It was a woman's voice, and it had a strange accent, where each word came out like a hiss. Rue took a closer look. The big one was a warrior. A great sword was propped up against the chair behind him. He wore a huge black fur cloak that along with his long shaggy hair and thick beard gave him a bear-like quality. The woman was slim with a large splayed hood that reminded Rue of a swaying serpent. The pale skin of her hands caught Rue's attention. They weren't pretty hands. The knuckles were calloused and scarred. He realised that they hovered over some sort of board. Rue's eyes darted between the two of them. Both had a board, divided into a grid of coloured squares that glowed softly in reds, blues and greens. Above the board floated a handful of coloured tiles. It was these small square tiles that they played with, sliding and pulling them across the board, their fingers flicking and swiping at astonishing speeds. The snake woman slid a red wooden tile and it rested over one of the softly glowing red squares of the board. The light pulsed and a strand of it leapt off the board and swirled around the one-eyed doll before infusing it with colour. The doll surged forward, hitting the other's shield hard and forcing him back a few steps. The big man grunted. His hands moved quickly across the board and the blue and green lights leapt from below his fingers, filling the soldier doll. This seemed to steady it, as the one-eyed doll pressed his attack. The soldier doll stopped his retreat, absorbing the kicks of his attacker. More light filled him, this time swirls a powerful red, and he surged forward rapidly, thrusting his spear. The one-eyed doll dodged two of them, but the third one caught him squarely in the chest. The doll sagged and fell, and the woman's board went dark. Her opponent's board, in contrast, pulsed powerfully, casting long shadows across the room. The soldier doll stood triumphantly over the fallen sackcloth doll. Both the man and the woman seemed disappointed. The soldier doll bowed to the hooded woman and then marched back to the bear-like warrior to stand guard by the strange board. So nothing, the big man asked. Nothing, agreed the woman. The tiles are not special. The totem is poorly made. He has courage, though. Yes, he fights within range of your spear. Very brave, very strange technique. The woman leaned back with a sigh, her face in the hood shadows. But a wasted venture, Cord. Remember why we are here. Cord folded his arms. The investigation. He sighed. I see little point. People die here all the time, Rin, especially those that cross the lady. Even so, we must investigate. Magnus was one of us, not easy to kill. Aye, to survive the construct war, then die to a common assassin. There is little justice in that. Magnus. Rue recognised the name. It was the noble who had been assassinated. The woman called Rin continued. Perhaps not just a common assassin cord. There are many rumours. Wizards are being looked for. Bowl's hoods seek them out. The Chris King stirs. Wisp players going underground. Cord raised an eyebrow. 
Well, more underground, said Rin with a shrug. Cord shook his head. Wizards have always been hunted down. And most of us are not immortal. We die just like the Nokos. It happens. Even if it is a sign he has returned, we should be reading our defences anyway. We need to find the six. Rin sighed. It was obviously an argument they had been through before. A fool's quest. Fifty years without a sign. You do not even know what they look like. She glanced at Cord's pack. You might already have them. You have collected so many. The warrior shrugged uncomfortably. Right now, our task is to investigate, said Rin simply. We are not investigators. I have no idea why Elsa sent us. I can investigate. I can be subtle. Cord glanced at the woman's brutal hands. Black scars crisscrossed her forearms. She noted his glance. More subtle than a giant bear man with big sword anyway, she said. Cord smirked but said nothing. His eyes fixed on the table. His doll glanced up as the silence hung thick in the air. Eventually Rin sighed. I will continue investigation. Talk to the wizards we know. The warrior shook his head grimly at that. Nothing will come of it. They are just scared old men. You will come? Cord shrugged. No, I'll go through his tower. See what I can find. So you will help me. I owe Magnus that much. He paused in consideration. You know, there is one person in this town that knows everything that goes on in it. Rin cocked her hooded head. You are talking of the Chris King, yes? Well, he would know. The never found Chris King? The legendary Chris King? I just find him and I just ask him? Well, it was just a thought. A very strange, impossible one. Rin turned and left the light of the overhanging lantern. Her dark figure paused at the door. But I will think on it. I wish you luck, Cord. You too. The warrior nodded as the woman left the tavern. Rue ducked down behind a barrel as Rin stood in the middle of the street, hesitating and casting a look back at the tavern door. She muttered something in a strange language and then continued down the road, disappearing into the mist. Rue slowly stood from his crouch and looked back through the window. The bear man sat there for a long time, lost in his thoughts, his soldier doll standing vigil over the hunched figure. Then he turned to the window. You might as well come in, lad, Cord said gruffly. The streets are not safe. The end of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Rue crouched down quickly. There was no way the man could have seen him. Again, the fear of magic washed over him. The street thief part of him wanted to run, to flee this man and this cursed part of town, to disappear back into his hidden home. There his day could begin as yesterday's had, and as tomorrow's would. That would be the smart thing to do. But why start now? Those dolls pulled at him. The tiny warriors that battled on the tabletop, this was his chance to take a closer look. He wouldn't get too near or stay too long. Rue stood and slowly entered the tavern. The air felt different here, no longer carrying the sickly taint of the cursed streets. Here it felt like a light breeze, invigorating and refreshing. He stood at the edge of the lantern's light, reluctant to take the last step into a strange world. The bear man sat opposite him, he seemed even bigger now. His brooding form filled the room. He gestured to the chair by Rue. Sit. Rue's eyes narrowed. It must be a trap. He had already risked too much lingering in this cursed town, standing in a room that glowed with magic. He found himself frozen, unwilling to take a step forwards or backwards. The silence hung between them as Rue held the warrior's gaze. He stood like an alley cat, offered food, ready to flee, but tempted to stay. Finally, the warrior shrugged. 
Go then. I have much to think on. Rue glanced at the open door and then at the table. It stretched out as a comforting barrier between them. Even with the imposing man looming in front of him, a great sword sitting within reach, Rue was drawn to the board in front of him. It still lay dark, the orbs of light gone. He slid slowly into the chair, angling it for a quick escape. The board was made up of twelve stone blocks laid out four by three. Six plain wooden tiles rested on it. Rue was sure they had been floating during the game. He was also sure there had been balls of light sitting on them. The bear man had been watching Rue watch the board. It needs to be reset after a match, he said. Take up the six tiles, then recast them. Rue eyed the tiles suspiciously. Then they will light up again? Perhaps. Rue glanced up at the warrior. Cord shrugged. It does not work for everyone. Why not? Well, most are no cos. Rue raised his eyebrows. Cord waved his hand dismissively. No cos. People who can't do magic. Rue nodded slowly, then suddenly snatched his hand back. What do you mean? The board tells us many things, lad. Cast the tiles and I'll tell you what it says. Rue raised an eyebrow and looked at the tiles again. I don't want to touch that poison. Cord shrugged again. Probably for the best. A life of magic is not for everyone. He half rose, reaching to gather the board. Wait, Rue whispered. The big man paused, then sat back into his chair. Rue bit his lip as he considered the board and the tiles. He was a small boy in a small world. This was big. Too big for any life he had imagined. He looked over his shoulder at the open door. The world outside seemed to shrink even more. Rue grimaced. He had to know. He snatched up the tiles and then cast them quickly across the board. They fell still. Stayed still, looking small and ordinary. Rue blew out a sigh. Whether from relief or disappointment, he wasn't sure. Then the six tiles shuddered and floated above the board. Reds, blues and greens lit up the room as orbs of colour formed over the tiles. They crackled softly with energy. Rue looked up at the warrior. The big man looked slightly impressed. What does it mean? That I can do magic? asked Rue. Potentially, maybe. With training. The bear man was watching the board. Your co is very strong. Especially the red. Rue was searching the board. My co? Your life energy. When you recast the tiles, the board attunes itself with the caster. It flares up with a reading of your co. Like I said, your red. It's very strong. What does that mean? Red is body, blue is mind, green is spirit. Most people living in a city have low green. Yours is quite good. Rue frowned. He didn't understand any of this. That green tile to your left, said the bear man. Slide it forward. Rue glanced up at the man. What will happen? The big man chuckled but said nothing. Rue grimaced and looked at the board. The green tile floated in the corner tantalizingly close to his hand. He touched it gingerly, trying to avoid the pulsing green orb that hovered over its center. It bobbed slightly in the air, as if floating on water. He flicked it forward, as he had seen the man do earlier. The tile slid across the board, passing over the colored squares, until it hit another floating tile. It settled to rest over a green square, the tile flared brightly, and a wisp of emerald light leapt into the air. Rue sat back in astonishment as the wisp swirled briefly in front of him, as if getting its bearings, and then plunged into the sleeping form of the sackcloth doll. The doll sat up. Rue gasped and leapt back, pulling his hands away from the board in shock. He teetered briefly on his chair, arms flailing to catch his balance, then crashed backwards onto the floor. The doll got to its feet and walked to the edge of the table, regarding Rue curiously with its large button eye. It waved. The bear man chuckled. 
Rue regarded the doll wearily from the floor. What is it? A totem. He's part of the game. All this, it's a game? Sometimes. Rue frowned as he got slowly to his feet. The bear man didn't give straight answers. Rue took a closer look at the doll. What's his name? No idea. I found him this morning. You found him? Aye. Along with the board and the tiles, all very old. They sometimes get left behind. A player finds a better doll, gets better armed. This one's been alone a long time. Probably since the Great Fall. He was under all the original rubble. He was abandoned. Rue settled back into his chair. The boy felt the warrior watching him closely. Aye. The doll sat down warily, gazing up at Rue. He's half asleep. He lost most of his power from the fight. Unlock more green. Green as spirit. Green as life. The big man held up one of his own tiles. In the game, red is strength and attack. Blue is defense. You understand? Rue shook his head numbly. He didn't understand any of this. He focused on the board, trying to concentrate. The other green tile sat in the middle, and a red tile blocked it from being able to slide onto a green square. Rue also saw that he could move the red tile down to unlock a red square. He did this, and then quickly slid the green. Two wisps of light leapt off the board and filled the doll. It leapt to its feet and gave a couple of excited hops. It then looked up at Rue. Rue frowned. You're free, off you go. The doll gave another leap of joy and scampered off. It hovered at the table's edge for a moment before leaping to the floor with an awkward thud. Quickly it got up, brushed itself off and ran into the shadows of the tavern. The big man watched it leave. It's bound to the board, lad, and its power will run out in a day. It needs a player to give it life. He watched the boy for a moment. You cannot set them free. Rue shrugged. He was wearing a street tough face, guarded and uncaring. The one-eyed doll returned, triumphantly carrying a spoon. It held it up to Rue proudly. The boy smiled in spite of himself. The doll nodded and set the spoon down. It scampered off again. What's your name, lad? said the big man. The boy regarded the warrior with narrowed eyes, weary again. The big man sighed. I am Cord, and this, he nodded to the soldier doll, is my totem, Ironside. The doll saluted crisply. Rue noticed he didn't even have arms. His spear and his shield floated close to his body, the same way the tiles floated over the board. Rue nodded back. Your totem? He fights for you. The warrior nodded. He fights for the game, lad. All wisp weavers have their own totem. I power him through the board, and yes, he fights for me. Then we practice our spell casting on them. It's less painful than casting spells on each other. Wisp weavers? Cord nodded. Yes, those that play the game of wisp. Rue shook his head again. It was too much to take in. I've never heard of it. That's because weaving is forbidden. This is a secret game. Still play today, so we can be ready when we are needed again. Needed for what? The same thing we were needed for last time. Rue frowned. His grasp on history was tenuous at best, made up of idle gossip and rumour. Didn't magic cause what happened last time, he asked. There's a cursed street out there that no one can live in. There's a scar all the way up to Roulon. That wasn't us. Us, said Rue, glancing up at Cord. You were there? I was a student at the school, about your age. I was there when it was destroyed. That was a long time ago. You do not look that old. We live a long time. So you fought against the constructs? No, I was too young, Cord said, his face growing dark. All I did was watch wizards die. An uncomfortable silence grew between them. Thankfully, the one-eyed doll returned, this time dragging a rusted mug behind him. He placed it next to the spoon, and then looked up at Rue. 
What's he doing? asked the boy. Cord glanced down at the doll. He shook himself from his dark mood. Maybe he's setting the table. They can be quite helpful. He gave a small smile. I think he's trying to impress you. Why? Perhaps he wants you to look after him. Rue felt his heart lurch. Me? he stammered. I can't look after him. Why not? The boy held up his grubby hands, covered in dirty fingerless gloves. He plucked at his ragged clothing. Look at me. Do I look like someone who can look after things? The doll tilted its head as it watched the boy. I'm sorry, I've got enough to worry about, Rue explained. Myself, mainly. The doll sat down, its head bowed sadly. I'll just lose it or break it. They can't be hurt, lad. They're made of stone and steel and... He glanced at the one-eyed doll and gave an apologetic shrug. Sackcloth. You don't only have to fight with them. Some people keep them as companions. Just power them up each day like you already have. I don't need a companion. Then fight other wisp weavers. Good players can make good coin doing it. Rue suddenly looked interested. Really? Yes. Once you know where to look for them. There are players everywhere. Even secret tournaments. Quite a few here in Yore, actually. Since the King's Law doesn't reach this far anymore. Cord's voice grew grim and he leaned forward. But this is still magic, lad. It's been banished, you understand. Do not get caught, especially being a Udai boy. The game must be your secret. But how do I keep using the board? Does the magic run out? Cord stood and gathered his sword. For a boy who won't even tell me his name, you sure do like questions. He looked down at Rue and then at the one-eyed doll and sighed. It's simple, lad. When six tiles are placed on the board, they light up. Slide a tile, and if it rests on its own color, it powers your doll. If it rests on a different color, it doesn't. When all six tiles have been moved, the board resets, and then the tiles relight. Different every time. Slide the tiles again to unlock more co. He held out his hand, and his soldier doll marched up his arm and sat on his shoulder. Understand? Rue shook his head. The warrior gathered his own tiles into a pouch and put his board into a backpack. Suit yourself, lad. Either take the totem or don't. He can stay here another fifty years. I care not. Rue turned quickly. You're leaving? Aye, lad. There's things I must do. The warrior filled the door frame as he looked back at the young boy. You can stay here for as long as the lantern casts light. It is a ward against the taint of this place. He made to leave, but then hesitated. Take the totem, lad. Many threads have converged tonight. It smacks of more than just chance. There is a grand weave at work here. Rue looked down at the doll. It stood quietly, heavy regard in its only eye. He heard the door close behind him. The room felt silent, and only the flickering lantern light interrupted the stillness. Finally, Rue cleared his throat. So, you're an orphan too, I guess. The doll did not move, but Rue noticed a slight tremble. The boy's face softened. He leaned forward and held out his hand. I have a home you can come to if you... The doll leapt swiftly onto Rue's hand and held on tight. He had a strength that surprised the boy. Rue smiled. Well, I guess that's a yes then. He gathered up the board and tiles. They fit snugly into his backpack. He also took the lantern off its hook and left the tavern, closing the door behind him. Rue headed home at a jog, his path now well lit by the lantern. There was little fear, despite running down a cursed street carrying forbidden magic in his backpack. Instead, he shared the joy of being out in the night air with a small doll that sat on his shoulder, who every now and then tugged at his ear and pointed in wonder at the pale crescent moon overhead. The end of chapter 8. Chapter 9. Cord stood in the shadows cast by the pale crescent moon and watched the guards go by. Twelve of them, looking alert and well trained. Magnus's tall tower lay on the other side of the street. It sat in darkness, unlit and abandoned. How quickly the world moved on. 
Cord watched the guards continue down the road. They would be back this way soon. The big man stepped out of the shadows and approached the tower. The door was heavily bolted on the outside. No doubt the whole place was shut down while the city decided what to do with it. Magnus had no family line to pass his wealth on to. Cord was certain of that. He was there when Magnus's family had died. The big man looked up. There was a balcony on the highest floor. He stepped away from the door and took to the air. He floated gently past the three stories and landed softly on the balcony's marble railings. Cord stood there for a moment and stretched out his co, searching for life. There was nothing substantial, just the small signatures of rodents and nesting birds. A faint tingling crawled across the floor of the balcony. Blood had been spilled here. He left the railings and crouched low on the stone tiles. The bloodstain was still here, mixed with spilled red wine. A golden goblet lay against the doorway. Not a robbery then. Cord left the balcony and walked silently into the room. It was pitch black. He couldn't afford to strike a match. The tower would become a lighthouse to the guards below. He burned his co, enhancing his senses. The room slowly revealed itself under a dull red glow. The place was a mess. The assassin had searched the place while Magnus lay dead on the balcony. Cord's burning vision noted that multiple footsteps still glowed softly on the floor. More than one assassin, it seemed. Their passing had left something sickly in the air, a twisted taint. It reminded Cord of the corrupted magic in the scar of the old town. It spread across the room in grey ribbons, showing faintly where the assassins had walked. He followed one trail to a tall bookshelf. Some of the books had been removed, the shelf clear of dust where the books had rested. Was this what they had killed Magnus for? A handful of books? There were a few bottles of corked wine stacked on the highest shelf. He grabbed one and glanced at its label. A good year, made before the construct war. Luxuries like wine had suffered for decades after the invasion. A toast thing, Cord thought, to his old teacher, and to Tilly. He pulled out a chair and sat at the dining table. It had been set for one, the utensils and a silver cup were still laid out. He uncorked the bottle and poured himself a drink. Never drink alone, he muttered and reached into a backpack for Ironside and his board. He sent a few green wisps into his totem. The small armoured soldier stood and shook himself awake. Hello soldier, said Cord. Thought we would remember some old friends. Ironside gave a solemn nod. Cord raised his glass. To Magnus and Tilly, he muttered. They deserved better. He held out his glass and Ironside gave it a bang with his shield. Cord downed it in one gulp. He re-poured. He couldn't remember the wife's name. She never taught him. He made a small toast for her as well. As a small child, Cord really hadn't liked Magnus the teacher. The man was cold and had little patience for his students. He seemed to like the superiority his position gave him. He wasn't above mockery when a student couldn't grasp the subtleties of magic. Cord had been one of those students. Already big for his age, Cord was far more interested in the physical activities that the school had offered, the weapons training, the athletics, and the sport. All of this had purpose, of course. Everything the school taught had purpose. Exercise strengthened your red co, the aggressive physical energy of magic. Magnus had taught the blue, the mental energy, that could be grown through meditation and problem solving. Cord had found the meditation boring and the mental exercises frustrating. He couldn't help but give a small smile as he looked across the room. His old teacher still had him trying to solve puzzles. His eyes settled on a picture hanging on a wall, a family portrait. There was Magnus standing with his arms around a tall, severe looking woman and a young girl. Cord's eyes narrowed. The girl didn't look like Tilly at all. She wasn't smiling for a start. 
Tilly was always smiling, acting the fool, trying to make Cord laugh. Magnus probably had the painting done when he returned to Yore, years after her death. Magnus had always wanted her to be more serious. It looked like he had finally figured out a way. Cord couldn't blame Magnus too much for that. Tilly could wear you out with her boisterous energy. What did Cord always say to her when she was driving him crazy? Grow up, Tilly, he muttered. The words filled Cord with an immense sadness. He took a long swig of the red wine and refilled his cup. He had visited her this morning, where she had died. He generally stayed away from the ruins of his old school. He was there when Carul's machines had reduced it to rubble, crushing the students within. He had no wish to relive that. But it was 50 years ago to the day. An anniversary of sorts. He came to pay his respects to the dead. The bodies were still in there, buried deep under the collapsed towers. Nobody came for them. The world had turned its back and moved on. He was surprised how little had remained of the school. The ruins had been overgrown with a tough scrub. Only one tower remained standing. He had weaved the purple to move aside some of the larger debris, to clear a space and see if there was anything he could recognise. Just broken stone and rotted wood. And the sackcloth doll. Some student's first attempt at making a totem. He felt a little bit bad about giving it to the Udai boy. He would never win a match with it. Something bothered him about the doll. Something he couldn't quite put a finger on. He put it out of his mind. There were more important things to think about. He drained the cup again and reached for the bottle. He froze. A small hooded totem stood beside the wine. A smoke-like shadow floated around it, making it shimmer in the darkness. Two blackened blades hung across its ragged back. Cord knew this totem, and a stab of fear went through him. Ironside moved between them, his spear out, his shield locked. Cord stood, and in one smooth motion his sword was out as he scanned the darkness. His co stretched out. Nothing. Ah, put that away, big fella. You don't want to get yourself dead, eh? The voice came from above. Cord looked up. A shadow of a man crouched in the rafters. Even with his red sight, Cord could not make him out. But he knew who this was. A mofa, said Cord. You did this. The shadow man stepped off the rafters and landed softly on the table. There wasn't a sound. Nah, not me, cuz. I just got here. I snuck in while you were toasting to your invisible ghost friends. Cord grimaced. He hadn't heard or felt a thing. The blackness surrounding the shadow man drifted away like smoke, leaving behind a short, bearded man. He only came up to Cord's chest, but he seemed bigger than him. He had a beast-like frame that radiated raw physicality. He crouched like a great ape, resting on the knuckles of his huge hands. It was said Amofa was the last survivor of a long-forgotten race. It was said he was immortal. Cord lowered his sword. If Amofa wanted him dead, it would have happened already. So, why are you here? he asked. Probably the same reason as you, I reckon. Trying to figure out who put Magnus down, eh? Cord frowned. And why would that concern you? Ah, me and Magnus go way back, bro. Don't want to brag or anything. But him and me and Kodan, us fellas saved the world a while back. Cord spent a few moments unravelling that statement. An eyebrow shot up. You were with Kodan. When he stopped the Construct army. Yeah, bro. Not that we get any credit or anything. Yes, none of the old books mention you being there at all, said Cord suspiciously. That's cause I'm very sneaky, mate. They don't call me the Ginger Shadow for nothing. I have not heard anyone call you that. Yeah, I know, I'm trying to bring it in, so feel free to spread it around, eh? Anyways, mate, Kodan made us promise not to tell anyone how we stopped Karul and his metal fellas. And full credit to Magnus. He didn't tell a soul, eh? Me, I probably would have blabbed for a beer. But you lot never talked to me anyways. Cord leaned forward. 
So you'll tell me how you did it? Yeah, nah, maybe. You do something for me first, eh? And then we'll see. Cord's eyes narrowed in frustration. This man knew Kodan, knew how he stopped the metal army, probably knew where the high mage disappeared to and where the lost six tiles were hidden. The answers to Cord's life work sat just a few feet across from him, and the strange squat man was using it as bait. Cord's grip tightened on his sword. Amofa chuckled. Ah, don't be dumb, bro. That part's only going to get you dead. Look, it's a pretty simple ask. Just when you find the fellas that did this, you let me know, and I'll sort it out, eh? Cord relaxed his grip. And then you'll tell me everything. Course, bro. We'll both be scratching each other's backs, eh? Like a sort of big, aggressive man hug. Cord frowned at that, but nodded. A deal had been made. How will I contact you when I find them? Amofa tossed him something. Cord caught it cleanly. It was a small green gem. You know what this is, Cord? Cord nodded. A calling stone. You find these fellas, and then you use it. And then I come, and I'll get really messy. Amofa's face softened. Look, me and Magnus weren't bros or anything. But we had each other's backs once. So I'm going to revenge him really good, eh? And look, mate, I've even put it at the top of my list. Amofa held out a tattered sheet of paper. It was indeed a long list, scrawled in blunt handwriting. Right at the top was, Revenge Magnus. Right under that was, Pick up milk. Before Cord could read any more, Amofa snatched it away. And if you know anything about us immortals, Amofa continued, You know it's our lists that keep us going, eh? Cord nodded slowly, and then cocked his head. You're affiliated with the Guild of Assassins, right? Should I start there? Nah, it's not them, eh? Already asked, bro. They say it wasn't even sanctioned, cuz. So they'll be chuffed for me to deal with whoever did all of this. Amofa reached out to his hooded totem. The small ragged figure melted away into smoke. Well, okay, bro. I'm gonna try follow these taint trails, eh? Don't like my chances, though. Probably have broken up in the breeze outside. Amofa continued. Now I look away for a moment, cuz. Cord glanced up. What? Yeah, just look away so I can disappear all mysterious-like. Cord frowned. Really? Yeah, I can't just walk out the door like a normal fella. I say, whoa, that bottle of wine looks pretty flash you've got there. Cord sighed and turned to it. Yes, it was made before the wars. Uh, would you like a cup? But when he turned back, Amofa was gone. The end of chapter 9. Chapter 10. Home for Rue was in a long abandoned tower that looked over Yore. It sat on a plateau, a kind of giant step carved into the side of a blue-grey mountain, the middle peak of three. The tower was part of a greater building, most of it reduced to rubble. Here and there a few other structures still stood and whispered of a grand age. Elaborate archways of white marble, several pillars jutting out at hard angles, intricate carvings on them still visible. A large section of floor peeked through a collapsed ceiling, tiled in swirling patterns of beautiful mosaic. Most was broken rock and ruin, covered in rugged scrub and twisted trees. Rue woke slowly, the sun not yet over the mountains, the world still smoky blue. On these warm summer nights, Rue slept outside the tower on a high balcony. He had made a lean-to out of old bricks and a portion of red sail to keep off the rain. His bed was made from part of the same sail, stretched between two long poles and held apart by rocks wedged at the top and the bottom. Rue sat up and scratched at his shaggy mop of hair. He gathered it up quickly, tying it back with a long piece of cloth. He looked out to a view worthy of kings. The tower was at the edge of the plateau, the ruins behind it, so the mountain fell away underneath him. The sprawling town of Yore stretched out before him, its lopsided towers tiny at this distance, 
tendrils of smoke from its many chimneys looking like broken bits of spiderweb swaying lazily in the wind. Beyond the town was the great blue of the ocean. Three ships were sailing into the harbour, a convoy from some distant land, out to the west. Rue knew the ports would be busy already, though he could not see them behind the haphazardly stacked city. The cursed part of town, the old section, drew the eye like a weeping sore, and with a start, Rue remembered last night. By the time he had made it up the winding path to the plateau, and then climbed up the hidden handholds to his balcony, Rue was exhausted and had barely gotten out of his damp clothes before falling into a deep sleep. Last night seemed a dream. He glanced over at his backpack. Beside it was the lantern from the tavern, its flame long gone. He swung his legs off the bed and walked stiffly across the stone floor. His body protested mightily. The escape from Vince's gang and the long, dark journey home had left him bruised and sore. With a groan, he sat down cross-legged and lifted the flap of the pack. The board was inside. Not a dream, then. That meant... Rue frowned as he surveyed his living area. The doll had been wide awake as Rue stumbled into bed, mumbling his good nights and telling it to make itself at home. He vaguely remembered hearing the small thing pottering around as sleep overcame him. There was no sign of it now. As he looked around the rest of the balcony, he realised that this was not strictly true. There were signs the doll had been here. His wet clothes had been hung on a line. They were now dry thanks to the warm night air. With amusement, he saw a cup and spoon had been laid out neatly on his low table. His small shelf of ragged books seemed to have been half dusted. A pile of rags sat on top. Hello? said Rue hopefully. There was no answer. No sound of scrambling little footsteps. Rue looked over the edge of the balcony. There was no little doll on the rocks below, just a few crisker turning over rubble looking for insects. Maybe it had left, finally able to explore the world. Rue felt his heart skip a beat. But Cord had said they need to stay by the board so the player can give it life. How long would its magical life last? Rue watched the Kriska for a moment and frowned. There were quite a few living up here in the ruins. They could be quite curious and mischievous. Maybe they stole the doll. He had heard of them stealing from other people, but it had never happened to him. The Kriska were hard to understand. Maybe bringing something magical into the ruins had stirred the Kriska into action. Still frowning, Rue wandered into the tower room. There had once been a winding stairway here, but that had long collapsed and filled with rubble. Much of the room had once been filled with this fallen rock, but over time Rue had stacked most of it into a large pile against the far wall. The bigger chunks of stonework that he couldn't move had become makeshift tables, most covered in a myriad of melted candles. A few Kriska nested up in the rafters. Rue didn't mind them being there. They kept the insects down. He looked over at the large bed that took up a corner of the room. The bed had been here when he discovered the place, and it had still been in good condition. He slept here in the winter months. There was nothing under it. Rue walked back out onto the balcony. A corner of the board peeked out of his backpack. Maybe the doll had crawled into there, to be near its life source. He pulled out the board and looked into the pack. For a moment he thought he spotted the doll, instead it was the pouch full of tiles. As he weighed them in his hand, he had an idea. He turned to the board. Its squares weren't glowing like they were last night. He looked down the sides. The board was thick, made of stone, about an inch high. Strange runes were carved along its edges. Was a spell needed to activate it? No, surely Cord would have mentioned that. He did say something about putting the tiles on the board to start the game. Rue took them out of his pouch. There were six of them, each made of wood, all with holes carved into the middle. He scattered them across the board. They moved unnaturally, all sliding and then settling perfectly above the squares of the board. The board then flared with colour. All the floating tiles lit up with small orbs of light. Rue moved the green tile, able to find a green square on his first move. The emerald wisp sprung off the tile. Rue watched it as it spiralled up into the air, 
much higher than it had gone last night. It circled the balcony in a lazy arc, and then suddenly plunged into a pile of rags on Rue's bookshelf. The rags shuddered, and then a small head poked out, its butt and eye wide with wonder. Rue laughed. <laughs> Good morning. The doll struggled out of the rags and stood unsteadily. It looked around with a vague air of confusion. Somehow its giant butt and eye looked half open. Not a morning person then. The doll regarded Rue curiously. The boy pointed at the board. More power? Come over here and help me play this thing. The doll stepped off the shelves and hit the floor hard. It stayed there, face down, arms splayed. Hmm, maybe I'll get it started. Rue turned his attention to the board. The green tile he had first moved had darkened, its whole burn black, the glowing light of the orb now extinguished. It had also stopped floating and settled to rest on the square of the board. Rue nodded to himself. This is how you could see the tiles you had already moved. The five other tiles beckoned, floating with orbs glowing softly. Rue studied them intently. The coloured squares on the board formed a pattern in his mind, and something inside him unlocked. He could see that this combination of tiles and light could not be fully completed. He quickly slid the tiles, first a red that hit the raised side of the board. It flared crimson on a red square. Next was the other green. It came to rest at the edge of the board, flashing emerald. Then a blue, bouncing against a dead green tile, a wisp of light leaping between his fingers. And then the other blue. Finally, as colours leapt off the board and swirled around him, Rue slid the last red tile. It came to rest on a square bathed in blue. This one didn't flare with colour. Instead, the orb fizzled, the tile burning black and settling on the dead square. As the last tile touched the board, it shuddered slightly and then rose again. All the tiles did, floating up together. Then they all softly crackled with energy as new orbs formed over them, blazing into blues, greens and reds. It was a new combination. This happened so fast that the colours that Rue had unlocked still swirled around him, seeking out the doll. Four flashing orbs, a green, a red and two blues, plunged into its tiny prone form and the doll leapt to its feet. It ran around excitedly in a wide circle, skipping with joy. It came to rest by Rue's knee, and it gave it a friendly pat. Rue smiled. That seemed to do the trick. The doll nodded. Rue noticed that the Kriska had started to gather. They watched him curiously. Some cooed softly. They don't seem to be getting angry, said the boy tentatively. Maybe the Chris King is okay with magic? The doll cocked his head curiously. You don't know the Chris King? The doll shook his head. Where have you been? Rue scoffed. Living under a rock? The doll nodded. Oh yeah, said Rue with a grimace. Yeah, you have. Well, when all the wizards were banished, one of them stayed behind and hid in the underbelly of this town. He watches over us and make sure no one gets too crazy. That's the Chris King. Rue pointed to the Kriska. These guys are his eyes and ears and keep a lookout on everything. And if they see you starting to do something out of the balance, they become a real pain until you start walking the straight again. No one really knows all the Chris laws, but the Kriska kind of let you know by the way they act. See, that's a nice sound they are making. I think we're okay. The boy studied the board. How much power do you need for the day? The doll stomped twice. You can count? The doll gave Rue an offended look. Hey, I'm all new to this, said the boy holding up his hands. So, two rounds on the board will keep you awake all day. The doll nodded. Okay, let's do it. They both studied the new layout on the board. The doll began to hop excitedly and Rue smiled. Yeah, I see it too. This combination allowed for all six tiles to unlock their colours. Rue swiftly moved them across the board as light sprung and swirled. The last tile, a blue, fell into place and threw a shock of sapphire into the air. As the six orbs of light swirled around the board, they pulled together into one huge orb of swirling colour. Rue watched in wonder as the crackling wisps circled around him, sending energy dancing across his skin. 
For a moment, all seemed still as the orb paused, hovering in front of the awestruck boy. Then it plunged like a diving bird into the dole, filling it with such power that it hovered briefly off the ground, body arched in rapture. The dole landed softly, head slightly bowed as if in gratitude. A moment of grace. Whoa, whispered Rue. He leaned back as the board reset itself. His jaw worked as he searched for words. Whoa. The doll nodded slowly in agreement. A dozen Kriska circled the tower overhead, chattering excitedly. Does that happen when you get all six tiles right? The doll nodded while rolling his hand. Ah, if you're fast enough. Rue let out a slow whistle. So you're all filled up now, right? We've got a big day ahead of us. Rue held up the gold coin. I have to get this to talk. The doll stared at the coin intently. He held out both his sackcloth hands as he reached for it. No, said Rue, not for you. He slipped it into the pouch around his neck. Rue lifted up his backpack. You can come, but you have to hide in here. You're, um, kind of forbidden. The doll tilted his head. Well, all magic is forbidden, and your magic. The doll spread his palms. Why? Because of that said the boy, pointing at the ruins below, as the doll leapt up onto the balcony's stone wall. Rue then looked out at the old town, the broken towers and collapsed buildings. And that. Magic did all of that. And much worse. There's a scar from here all the way to Rue Lawn. Rue turned from the edge of the balcony. Do you know about Car Rule? At the mention of the name, the doll glanced up sharply. It nodded grimly. You do? Were you here when he attacked? The doll shook his head. It made several chopping gestures with its hand. Oh, after, Rue sighed. Well, this was his school, a school of magic, until he destroyed it with an army of iron giants and then marched on to the king. The king bet him, though, and then he forbade all magic. He closed the school, even though it was already destroyed, and then he banished all the mages. He also crushed the Udai out on the plains because Karul was an Udai, like me, and because they still did magic and wouldn't stop. That was a long time ago, before I was born. Now nobody but Kriska come up here. Everyone thinks it's cursed like the old town, but it's, it's not. Only I live up here. You can't use the stairways, see? They were collapsed when I found it. You have to climb around the outside, up the walls. A proud grin tugged at the boy's mouth. And most people can't do that. He reached down and held up some knotted rope. You need this for the last part. I pull it up before I go to sleep. He lowered it over the edge. He paused. I don't think I've ever done so much talking in my life. The doll nodded in agreement. You too, huh? Said Rue with a smile. He regarded the doll for a moment. Do you have a name? The doll pointed at Rue. I name you. A nod. Well, I had thought of something, said Rue slowly. How about Oni? It's an old sailor word. It means one. The doll touched his button eye. Rue smiled. Yeah, because of that. The doll gave a small leap of joy. Rue chuckled as he slung the backpack over his shoulder and lifted its flap. Well, are you coming, Oni? The doll scrambled up Rue's outstretched arm and dove into the pack. The boy closed the flat, leaving a small space for a curious button eye to look out from. He lowered himself down the knotted rope. Let me show you my hometown. The end of chapter 10. And hey, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that, please leave me a generous tip of one like. And may the Chris King watch over you. And if you want to keep track of my latest content, you're welcome to subscribe. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you soon. Bye.